All right. Today we'll talk about um, vectorization. Uh, I think we'll spend uh, probably a couple of lectures on this. Um, the, the general idea here is that sometimes we need to, we want to operate on lots of data in essentially the same way. And it's kind of a waste to use an entire instruction to just operate on one item on data, of data. So Intel added a lot of instructions that support um, not just Intel, but um, uh, many CPU manufacturers have added uh, instructions that, that support operating on larger registers that have what they call packed uh, data types. So you might have a 128-byte register that then consists of 16 um, bytes, right? And each one of those bytes is individually operated upon by an instruction. Say you have an increment. Oh, I don't think there's an increment. But say an increment. Rather than incrementing the 128-byte value by 1, we now increment each byte in this vector of, of bytes by 1. Right. So this is... Um, uh, it's called uh, single instruction multiple data. Um, Intel likes to call it vectorization. I, I see. I think in GCC and in compilers it's called vectorization. There's two kinds of SIMD really. There's the this one that we'll talk about um, in the next couple of lectures, and then there's uh, the one on GPUs, which is quite similar, not quite the same. And we'll um, we'll look at that later on too. I think. Okay, but before we get into this, um, any questions on the homework? Yeah, so it's it's due next Tuesday. That's right. Um, I would suggest um, visiting Ben in his office hours. He's done the homework. You should know how it works. Uh, that could be very helpful. Um, Okay, so um, I guess why don't we start by just looking at um, what code can look like when it's been compiled with vectorization, and then um, and quickly we'll uh, go back to uh, an overview of the whole instruction set. I think we need quite a bit of kind of background in order to be able to read this stuff. So we'll take a, a quick look at something first. Um, I think that should do it. All right, so here's a little program. Um, it just adds up a bu bunch of characters. In fact, uh, why don't we look at the program too? Okay, uh, so this is the program. Forget about this part. Um, that's what we're doing. We have a character array. We're adding them all up. And because we're adding them all up into a single character here, we're going to be losing a lot of... Well, they could all be zeros, except for one or two, in which case we won't lose anything. But, you know, um, there's not enough room in one character to add up uh, a million of these characters, generally speaking. But never mind that. Here's the code. Right? We just wanted some of those. Um, I guess we would expect it to take a while. Right? We would need to do a read for each one of these. Um, it would be a, a read and an add, at least. So probably, and then we have uh, have our our increments and so on, as we did in the midterm, you know, probably there's a lot of parallelism among the instructions, but it's probably going to take us at least a couple of cycles per element. Right. So um, we have a million of those, so that means um, it should take us uh, a couple of million cycles. In fact, um, why don't we try building it? Uh, let's see. But I'll do it without SIMD for now. Uh, no tree vectorization. Oh. What's it called then? Uh, 
on. Loop vectorize. Not really vectorize. Okay, so now it'll probably look quite different. Let's actually look at that too while we're at it. Um, so here's the code now. It's more familiar. Uh, in fact, where is it? Ah, here it is. All right, so it looks like uh, we are adding, we unrolled the loop four times, like the compiler unrolled the loop. So we save a little time there, and then we're uh, going four bytes at a time around until we're done with our million. Okay, uh, so that maybe should go a little faster. Let's see how long it takes. In fact, now I, uh, I added some instrumentation that counts the number of cycles. Let's see what it looks like again here. Uh, RDTSCP, that's a, a read time stamp counter. And the P, there's there's two different. There's one RDTSC, which are kind of imprecise, and then RDTSCP, which is a serializing instruction, which means it doesn't get to be reordered with other reads and writes. You'll get much better timestamps if you use the RDTSCP, but it's a little slower. Anyway, um, um, what did we get? So we're counting just the number of cycles before. We read the number of cycles, and we get the cycles after. Pretty accurate, down to you know um, tens of cycles. You can probably rely on on this stuff. Um, but of course, uh, there's lots of instructions in flight and all that sort of thing. You, um, you you shouldn't expect single cycle accuracy or be able to really get much out of it at that at that accuracy. But but here we're talking about millions of instructions, so it should be okay. And what do we see? Well, it took um, 2.4 million cycles. That's sort of in the right ballpark. Um, so uh, to go faster than that, we do need to, well, we have two choices, I suppose. We could use multi-cores, uh, multi-threaded programming, right? We could split the array into several pieces and then uh, run it that way. In fact, oh, I wonder. Uh, we probably should try that too, but let, let's do that in a minute with OpenMP. Um, right, or we can try to vectorize this thing. So with loop vectorization, and we'll see the details in a little bit. The code looks more like this. So this is the same loop, right? But now instead we're going 256 bytes at a time. Um, and it looks like eight instructions add up 256 bytes, essentially. But then there's some other stuff here, too. Like what used to be relatively simple code is now a whole bunch of these adds. It looks like they're 16 bytes apart. Um, that's 256 bits, is it? No, 100. Are they 16 bits? No, they're 32 bits apart. 32 bytes apart, 256 bits. Um, and then we're doing a whole bunch of other stuff here, somehow, to finish up. And then, um, and then we're done. Okay, so let's see how that runs. Right. Okay. So in this case, we saved a little time. Um, what? Uh, Seven hundred thousand cycles. Um, but maybe it's not as dramatic as one might uh, have hoped. Right. We have all these extra instructions. We should have gotten major speed up. Uh, yeah? Uh, I don't recall what the actual program looks like at this point, but is the sum supposed to be zero? Yeah. It's not, uh, it's not initialized. Okay. So um, because it's a global, it'll come from BSS, it'll, it'll be a zero. Yeah. Um, it doesn't matter. I, I wanted it to, to ge generate the code. Uh, and the, what it does is not that important. Um, uh, what was I saying? Yeah, right. So I think this brings up an important point with vectorization. Um, it's not always that we are limited by how many ads we can do, right? The CPU can do four ads at a time, uh, four ads per cycle. It's a quarter cycle per ad, because there's two ad units and each can do two per cycle somehow. Um, 
And so now we're doing more. Each one of these uh, vector adds. Let's see, actually, why don't I pull that up too? Um, what's it called? VP add B. Okay. Let's see if it's in here. Oh. Come on. Okay. That's not the one. There. Um. Hmm. Looks like, yeah, and I'll tell you about all the details in a bit, but it looks like we can do these parallel ads. Um, in fact, is this, the, this is the throughput. Yes, we can do two parallel ads per, per cycle as well. So we can do, so here we're adding what? 16 of them at a, at a time, right? And we can do two of those, so 32 of ads per cycle. So why are we not going eight times faster? Because we're not bound by the adder, really. Right? Now we're limited by something else. In this case, it's reading from memory. Right? We had a megabyte, and we need to read all of this stuff in. It's going to take us some time. The read instructions, um, seem, or, or sorry, the read micro operations is what's, what's limiting us, us in this case. Um, I think these things are important to, to keep in mind. Whenever you're trying to optimize something, you know. You need to profile, of course, to make sure that the code that you're uh, optimizing is the code that we're spending time on. But then um, it's, you, try to, you need to try to pay attention to what is actually a limiting factor. Um, sometimes it'll be latency. Sometimes it'll be throughput of some memory bus. Um, like it could be instruction latency. It could be latency to get some results from another, from another core. Um, Lots of different factors. It's not always uh, useful to just add resources in the sort of in the wrong place. In any case, it did help. We were limited by it, by the adder. Right? Um, four wasn't enough, but it looks like we couldn't really push more than uh, what, eight, six or eight or so anyway, memory-wise. Okay, so um, let's take a look at. Actually, let me look at the, the code again just to show you what's going on. The general idea here is we have, we're clearing out some registers. We're doing a bunch of these parallel weirdo ads, which we'll see in a bit how they work. But then because these registers have like 16 values in each, 16 values is not a sum. So now we have to get, get those, those 16, add them up somehow. And there's no, no very good instructions for that. Um, and then we need to get them back out into a general purpose register so we can kind of return it in RAX. Uh, so that's what's going on here. Oftentimes with vectorization, you, you have sort of a prefix part where we're preparing the data for uh, vector instructions. Then we're running the tight loop. And then we have some way of getting the data out of the, of the vector registers. And the uh, prefix and and the suffix can take quite a bit of time as well. In this case, it's a long loop, so it doesn't really matter. In, in other cases, it could end up not being worth it just because there's a lot of setup before you can start using these fast instructions. OK, so that's sort of a um, uh, brief intro to it. Let's take a closer look at what's actually provided by, um, by Intel and, and AMD. I think they, they kind of have a a little race where they each invent their own new instruction set and you know, add that to their CPU, their latest CPU. Um, and then the competitors have to support that because otherwise programs won't run. And then the, the other guy adds some more instructions and like that. Um, occasionally, there will be some instructions that just kind of fall off the wayside and they're not available in the next CPUs and then you can't use them anymore. It's a little bit of a mess. but. Um, Let's see, CPU SIMD instructions on the x86 family. All right, so you may have heard, probably have heard, in the marketing literature things like, I'm not sure you were even uh, actually reading the marketing literature when this came out, 
MMX. Does that sound familiar? Maybe SSE, SSE2, and it goes up to 4.2, I think. And then there's um, more recently AVX, AVX2, and AVX512, which is not quite there. It's kind of an exotic beast at this point. So these are like the, the, the broader categories of extensions. The X is, uh, this is multimedia extensions, I think. This is streaming. I don't know what the other S is for. Um, no, extensions. Um, and then these are the advanced vector extensions. And all of these are kind of, they, they come with a little bit of extra functionality in the CPU. They introduce some new registers. And then they introduce a bunch of instructions. And it kind of grows over time. I think the first ones were probably introduced in the probably in the 90s. Um, and then this is something that was introduced in 2015 or so and still isn't really out in the market. So we'll take a, a look. I've tried to sort of summarize everything that's going on here. There's a ton of instructions and there's a ton of details with you know, error handling and that sort of thing. And we're going to kind of skip past a bunch of that. Uh, but in order to, to make the code readable and in order to help you write some of this, which you will do eventually. Um, uh, we need to have a general idea at least of how this stuff operates and what, what the sort of big picture is. All right, so this MMX, it started out, that was the first step. Actually, before, before all this, there was something called a fl floating point unit, F FP unit. That's the one that provided uh, Things like a float and a double in C, right? You you want to add a couple of floating point numbers together. You can't use that. You can't use your uh, RAX for that sort of thing. The general purpose registers are integers only. So then, if you wanted to do any sort of floating point operations, you either had to implement it in software. Initially, it was like that. Um, in my dad's first computer. Uh, was like that. There were no floating point. Uh, and then, but then there was an extra socket next to it where you could put a floating point unit. So an extra CPU next to it that you could ask to do the floating point stuff. Eventually they, they kind of integrated that and that um, was still kind of clunky. There was a completely separate operation with some weird stack and stuff for the floating point values. I don't think that we really see much of of those functions used anymore. It's still supported, um, but the, those instructions aren't really uh, used anymore. I think after SSE, everyone uses that for floating point. I could be wrong. OK, MMX introduced. Um, so this was back in the, this is a 32-bit extension. Back in the era of 32-bit um, addressing modes, right? You're running your CPU in 32-bit mode. You don't have your RAX, you have EAX, 32-bit uh, registers. Um, but it still kind of is with us. And the instructions that provided here later got extended. This is why we kind of need to, need to know about it. This provides for packed operation on integers. So we have 64-bit new 64-bit registers called uh, mm0 through 7. All right, so it used to be that we had uh, your EAX and, let's see, I have a picture here somewhere. Oh, that's okay. Um, we, it used to be we have your, your, your 15 general, not even 15, uh, eight general purpose registers in 32-bit. In uh, now these guys introduced a new MM registers which uh, provide packed operation. And what does this mean? Uh, basically, um, it goes like this. So we have these eight registers, each of which 
can be seen as consisting of eight bytes or four words or two double words, a double word being a 32-bit integer. And a quad word is 64-bit integers, but those don't, didn't exist yet. All right, so the, the, the point of MMX is to allow us to operate on all of these at the same time. Um, so something like this. <coughs> where you have two operands, say uh, MM1 and MM2, and we say, oh, P add, because all the MMX instructions, they are prefixed with a P for parallel or packed, probably packed is good. Um, so we say P add MM0, MM1, then it, this being the operation, so now we get like the third, the fourth, uh, these would be uh, word uh, added to the fourth word in the second source and, and, and so on. So this was it's quite a revolution at the, at the time. Um, there's there's uh, different variations on, on these instructions, on the, your, your typical MMX instructions uh, being like um, add, multiply, um, shift, Simple ALU things. Um, there's a divide, I think. In fact, um, we, can, we can pull up a list. I have a list of that too. The stuff provided. I thought this is beautiful. So most of these pictures are from the Intel reference manual. And you can pull them out yourself. But scrolling through those thousands of pages wasn't right for the for class. So here are all the instructions, essentially all the instructions provided. Um, so we start out with with your uh, normal normal arithmetic. Uh, uh, it ends with a B if you are adding them byte wise, right? With a W if you're adding them in 16 bits at a time, or with a D if it's a double word, 32 bits at a time. So here we're getting sort of a two times speed up, four times speed up, and eight times speed up, or at least maximum capacity of of adding. In the little example we had, we were probably memory bound, but uh, uh, in, in many applications, um, we'll see one in a little bit, we're compute bound. You, you want to say, apply a filter to an image. Right? Run this filter over the entire image, there's a lot of compute and not very much memory, everything sitting in your, in your L1 cache. Um, well, maybe for large images, who knows. Um, okay, so there's multiplication. It looks like there wasn't any division at the time. And okay, so now we've we've added things up. And usually, you know, it's not enough to, to add things. Usually, maybe we want to have some logic. Like you want to add all these values up and see, oh, if it's greater than 100, well, then we want to do something. Unfortunately, there's no there's no logic in vector instructions. It's not like you can have a a vector branch. That would be pretty cool. Where you'd say, like, for each one of these four, do a different branch, right? Or these 16 byte values, like, run this part of the for loop for these and that part of the for loop for those. It's not like that. It's one instruction always, right? Um, so if you want any sort of logic, uh, you can compare. The compare instructions, again, start with a with a P for, for packed, but the rest is very similar to uh, normal scalar operations. Um, so then you end up with a one or a zero in each of the, of the resulting bytes. Right? So now we have eight <coughs> ones or zeros. That's still nice and parallel. Um, and then you could unpack some of these. You could try to uh, pull them out into general purpose registers to get one of these values and apply logic to one of them. Or you could try to um, pull them out and then add them up together if that's we want, what we want, and so on. Generally speaking, there are almost no instructions that go horizontally, that that um, add up the, the bytes. Let's see. Um, so so you couldn't compute with vector instructions the sum of these four. 
generally speaking, that's not uh, doesn't exist. There's there's a s very small number of them in the really advanced versions later on. So you you end up having to deal with these at some point later on to try to pull them out. Um, and there's see what uh, what we have in our instruction set to do that. Um, the the standard way, or sorry, the there's a few different ways, but the very common way is you move the register to memory. Like you have your 256, no, in this case, 64 bytes. You move it to an address, and then you move with a normal instructions for the general purpose registers back in from memory. It's the easiest way. Uh, there are some other ways to do it too. I don't know if they. Uh, let's, really, let's see what this unpack does. Uh, no, it's okay. We have some some examples of this later on. Okay, so some some a uh, um, uh, couple of different versions of this, depending on the suffix. Right? If you have uh, with this little s in it, you see this is okay. So here's um, add. That's add s and add us. The, the normal one is your, your typical add, which would, if you, if you add beyond the size of the type, so it's, a, um, if it's an 8-bit type, you know, if you go beyond 255, next time you add, it's a 0, if you add 1 to it. Uh, but then there's a couple of others, the, these saturation-based counters, where, or instructions, where 255 plus 1 is 255. This would be the case for unsigned saturation, or in the signed case, 128, right, 127 plus 1 is 127. Uh, because if it's signed, if you add one more, it would go to minus 128, and we don't want that. Do I remember this correctly? It's, it's minus 128 and plus 127, right? Not the other way around, yeah. OK. Um, All right, not that much else going on here. OK, so we have um, move between registers. Uh, there isn't really a good way to move from a general purpose register to, in, in this instruction set, there isn't a good way to move from general purpose registers to the uh, MMX registers. They just figured that's unnecessary because you can go through the L1 cache, I suppose. But that, that does add some cost, because every load from L1 cache still is going to take you four cycles. OK, um, let me see what else we had for MMX. Not much. This was a pretty small sort of instruction set. They were kind of dipping their toes into the water at this point. Um, SSE went from 64-bit to 128-bit registers. New ones called XMM 0 through 15. So, so SSC is now a 64-bit extension. It's actually available in 32-bit as well, but then you only get eight registers. You don't get uh, 16. I think it has something to do with the instruction length. Maybe they didn't have that extra bit. I don't know. Um, but in any case, SSC, at least in the, in the start here, provides floating point operations. So here we have 128-bit uh, packed single floats uh, in a register. Let's see. So that will be what, four in one register. Um, so a single float is a it's a 32-bit value, and a double is a 64-bit value. The, I think the floating point unit, it must still be in use on the, uh, in x86. There's also support for 80-bit values. Um, I guess that's 64 bits of the mantissa <coughs> and 16 bits of the exponent, probably. 
OK, in any case, here you get um, uh, something similar to the, to the uh, MMX situation, but we're doing uh, floating point operation instead. This was very important uh, when Intel wanted to start competing on the supercomputer arena. Because with supercomputers, they're all talking about flops. Right? And if all you have is a single floating point unit doing a one operation per cycle, if you're really lucky, um, it doesn't get you very far. But now, suddenly, you can pack in four flops at a time. Uh, I think that probably helped them break in a little bit. Um, so now it starts getting a little bit more complicated. Here's our operation execution environment now. So this is a 32-bit picture. I don't know why Intel insists on that, but um, that should be 2 to 64, of course. Uh, so you have your 16 general purpose registers. It's uh, 8 in 32-bit. Uh, you have your 8 64-bit registers, which are split into uh, to various size integers. That's the MMX registers. And then there's the XMM. I love the naming because it's so uh, <laughs> easy to confuse the two, right? Um, so the XMM registers, they support, um, right now at least, floating point operation only. Single, uh, single precision floating point operation. I think that's useful sometimes, but it's hard to do any proper science with single, uh, single precision floating points. Um, so they address that in a, in a little bit. Um, there's also an interesting ad addition of these streaming stores, and maybe we'll see that a little bit in a little bit more detail later. But as there's a streaming store. The um, I think the the instruction has an NT in it. There's a move NT. And then there's a size, like DQA or something. Um, and the, the point of the streaming stores is they don't use the cache at all. So if you say, the same with streaming loads, I think. But stores are the Im important one. So you try to, um, you, you write out the value. Usually, you would end up invalidating a cache line somewhere. This ends up in the. Your, your store ends up in the store buffer until the cache line arrives, right? And eventually, you get the store it out. Um, and then it's strictly ordered because of the store buffer, and things kind of get a little, uh, little sluggish. And with the streaming store, it's useful for, for media. Um, you, know, you have this picture. You want the whole picture over there. And you don't care which order this picture is written out in. Like, the bytes go whatever order you want, as long as you can just say, and, and let me know when you're done. Once, it once it's written out, then we'll do this other thing. Um, so with a streaming store, um, it issues the write directly to memory. It doesn't uh, do anything with the store buffer. There's no guarantees on ordering. It's all very confusing. Uh, but it goes straight out, and, and that means you can run as many of these store instructions as you want, um, like one, one per cycle uh, forever, mm -hmm. essentially. Uh, no matter how slow the the other CPUs are being in returning cache lines and things. Um, it does issue an invalidation to the other uh, cores. They eventually get their cache lines invalidated, but it doesn't wait. OK, so anyway, um, there were some streaming stores. Let me put that in there. If you care about ordering with respect to streaming stores, uh, probably you shouldn't use it. but um, sometimes you care about ordering in the sense that, oh, I'm done. So then uh, there's an instruction called sfence, which says basically, OK, and now the next store that I'm doing needs to happen after all of those are done. And so um, yeah, that kind of gives you the facility of saying, you know, like setting the ready flag or, or I think uh, they're probably already ordered with respect to atomic operations, although I can't swear to that. All right. So all of these instructions are floating point values. 
they end in PS for packed single precision or SS for scalar single precision. So let's see what this looks like. Excuse me. So this is um, very similar to what we saw before, but this is for packed single precision floating point operations. Now you get four of these float sort of things happening at the same time. And then scalar. Um, <coughs> like this. Note here that um, all of these operations they are overriding uh, one of the operands. So you, you, you say like add, the, add uh, XMM0, XMM1, uh, I think it's XMM1 that gets overwritten. Okay so in this case here we're doing a scalar operation. Um, so we're adding x and y, whatever. Uh, but the scalar that only works on the on the um, sort of lowest order one of the of the bytes. They take the same amount of time to execute, but sometimes you just you know you just want to add the last value. You don't want to mess with the rest. So we, there's lots of scalar operations in there too. And this is why I think that the floating point units aren't really used that much, um, unless you want the long double, the AD bit upper. 80 bit precision because um, it's really quite convenient uh, this thing with 16 registers and everything sort of um, sane looking with respect uh, compared to the, the floating point stuff the old floating point stuff all right so um, let's see ss scalar single precision PS uh, packed single precision. And <clears throat> I think they noticed that it was pretty inconvenient. Like you get these values into your four or eight or 16 wide array. And all you can do is just add straight down. Like there isn't that much you can do with like how do you do a general purpose computation with this? It's fine for the example we had. Add up all the numbers. That's great. Um, it probably is okay if you want to say multiply two arrays, um, multiply two matrices element wise. It's beautiful. But if you want to do something a little bit more clever, not so much. So um, they started introducing these other instructions are quite useful but uh, takes a steady hand um, this one's called a shuffle um, where you get to take two of the um, high order words and say which uh, which order you want those um, so here like you can pick you see those two oh sorry the, the two the two low order words you, you can pick any one you want from the from one of the registers and then the two high order words, pick any one you want from the other two. That's, just, that's what they call a shuffle. I guess it's a little bit like shuffling cards. Maybe that's why they call it that. Um, and then there's an interleave, which is sort of similar. Um, so the high order words get kind of interleaved into the destination register. Um, and then there's, um, no, let's leave it that way. So, you know, there's so very many different ways you could want to move your, your uh, register values around, right? And they, so they don't provide all possible ways. And the, I think the reason is that, let's see, in this case we have only four, uh, but it's four each, let's see, so it's four, four uh, factorial, isn't it? Like the, the possibilities here. So that's a whole lot of instructions if you want to specify a particular order that they should be shuffled in. Um, I think they just figured we'll, we'll do a small set of them and you can combine a couple if you want to do something more complicated uh, to keep the amount of silicon down. 
So uh, packing and shuffles, uh, sorry, shuffles and, and uh, interleaving are um, two of those ways of kind of moving things around in your, within your vectors. And then they also provide some new instructions, new integer instructions on the MMX registers. So, so you don't get to use the XMM for integers. You use the MMX for integers and the XMM for, for floats. All right. And then there's uh, SSE2. By the way, there are all these different extensions, right? And there's many more than this. These are just the major families. And then there's like all this partic particular extension for counting the number of set bits in a word. It's called uh, pop count. That's its individual extension. Uh, and there's many of those. Um, the general idea is you need to tell your compiler. You tell it, when you compile the program, you need to tell the compiler, oh, I have these instructions. Because right? otherwise, you're going to end up using some whatever vector multiplication thing for a register that doesn't exist in your computer. Um, so now you've told your program you have to run on this architecture. And then someone tries to run it on a different architecture because you compiled it. It got installed with apt-get or whatever. What happens? Unfortunately, it's easy to provide backward compatibility, but it's almost impossible to provide forward compatibility. Right. So you try to run a program with this pop count instruction in it, um, you're going to get an invalid instruction interrupt. So the CPU, sorry, the, the OS will see, oh, they tried to run, run this instruction, but the CPU doesn't know what it is, kill the program. That's it. So if you want to have a general purpose program, say you're writing a, a game, right? This game needs to be fast. Right? What are you going to do? Well, you could, you could tell the compiler, I don't know what's going to be at the other side. So let's just go with the general purpose instructions. It'll be fine. But of course, that's going to be slow. Um, you could deliver the source right, to the user and a compiler, and then the uh, user could compile it. That could be part of the installation package. What do you think? You don't like that? Why not? Well, I can just imagine some old lady trying to compile something. Right, it's just part of the installation program, right? The old lady doesn't know how to copy f like DLL files to the right whatever Windows folder either. But it seems to work most of the time. So why not just deliver the sources instead? Well, of course, it's insecure because then they can modify the game to be how they want it to be, right? That's my game. Well, I mean, that would be fun, I think, if you could change the program. It's insecure in what sense? Who cares about security? Privacy. Privacy. Uh, it's my game. I'm changing my game. Piracy. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Piracy is the problem, right? Um, Someone else can easily take the sources, change it to have a different brand name on it, and start selling it as, as their game, right? Or if you have these uh, license codes and whatnot, very easy to remove the if condition that checks for the license code, and then you have a free game. Right? It uh, is actually maybe not that complicated, at least it didn't used to be complicated, to get rid of the license code in a, in a program. Once you know how a disassembler works, you can figure it out, but but I think they they're getting more and more clever. So I don't know what it looks like lately. Uh, but in any case, um, point being, you can't um, you can't deliver the source because that's your intellectual property. You probably want to sell it, want to make some money. So okay, any other ideas? Is there a way to ask the processor what it supports? Yeah. There's, a, there's an instruction called CPU ID. You get back a big fat struct, and there's lots of bits in it. 
most of them reserved if you have an old computer, many of them used if it's a new computer. Right? Um, and so you check a particular index in the, this struct, and it'll say, if that one is a one, then you have these 15 instructions. Right? Uh, so that's part of the, of the standard uh, effect. Let me pull up here from the developer manual. Here it is. Oh, wait, FMA. I have no idea what FMA is. But hardware support for FMA is indicated by CPU, CPU ID, blah, 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 bit 12. Right? And here's how you can check the whole thing if you have FMA. OK, then what? Yeah. So now you have to make lots of different programs. Like you compile your program for lots of different uh, architectures. Or if you don't want to take it quite that far, you can compile the, the main functions, the tight loops in your code where performance really matters. You, you make different versions of those functions. And depending on uh, what CPU ID says, you set some function pointer to say, oh, like compute the, what goes on the screen thing. All right, that's this function because we don't have the AVX uh, 512 extensions in this machine. Um, so I think that's what that's pretty much how they would have to do it. You could call it a fat binary, perhaps. Apple calls it a fat binary when you even run it for like a program comes with code for uh, different architectures. Like they used to run on a, not on x86. They used to run on. PowerPC, and before that, they ran on 68K, Motorola 68K. They're kind of used to moving between architectures. So a program for a, for a Mac, at least used to, um, come with like code for lots of different architectures, at least a couple of different architectures. That's fine. OK, so um, there's some, uh, some integer instructions. What was I going to say about that? Uh, oh, yeah, so there's a, a, a max and a min, which are kind of ha handy. And an average, uh, which we may or may not find use for uh, for a future homework. Um, OK, but they still operate on the MMX registers, unfortunately. All right, so then uh, let's take a look at SSE2. And they actually allow us to, to work on, um, on the XMM registers as well. That's the main contribution. So the, um, here we have 128 bit packed byte, word, double word, and quad word float uh, integers and double precision floats. I think SSE2 is probably where um, the x86 architecture sort of graduated to a, a proper SIMD. Like now we, we have a lot of good stuff. Uh, it's not just kind of trying our way. Um, so here there's um, um, packed integer operations on the XMM registers. And then, of course, back double. And they uh, ending with um, a PD. Instead of PS, they end with PD um, and SD for packed double and, and the scalar double. OK, so um, it looks similar to in the past, but we're uh, going a little bigger. So now we have 128 bit ones, right? 16 bytes at a time that we can do adding on, let's say, and multiplication, that sort of thing. Um, and the rest is sort of the same, except for our, our uh, uh, double precision floating point operations. So you get two of those operations at the same time because of your 128 bit values. Um, the 
one nice thing here is that all of the um, MMX register operations that used to be supported are now supported without any extra names. Right. So um, you don't have to add some new prefix because you're going to use the XMM registers. It just you say which that you want to use with those registers instead of the MMX registers. You specify the register and, and that's it. Um, you can't add an XMM register to an MMX register. Like, you can't mix them. It's got to be uh, one or the other, as far as I know. In fact, um, in the in the Agner Fo Fogg's uh, reference, there's a nice specification for this. Um, let's see, move. Yeah. So these are just these specify what you can do. Right? What you can specify is op operands. Here we have a memory operand. That's an immediate, like a number five. Right? Register operands. You can move from register to register and so on. Go down a little bit. Um, to the vector instructions. Come on. Loading point. Ah, here we go. Right. Um, so here we can specify either an MM register or an XMM register. Right. Uh, MM0 through 7 being the MMX registers, and then the uh, XMM0 through 15 being the uh, the SSE registers. I don't think you get to mix them. Um, sometimes they say even uh, V uh, yeah, so with the V's it means any vector register. And the Y, we'll get to that in a little bit, those are the 256 wide. But you can kind of see the trend here. Right? The vector registers get wider and wider, and we add a few instructions along the way. Try to generalize the, the instruction set. Um, yeah, so the instructions are basically integer, integer, let's see. Okay, and then. <coughs> Um, oh, uh, right. This was added. You know, whatever is SSE, which which version of SSE is what, is not that important. But I think kind of this uh, this progression maybe isn't uh, isn't completely worthless. Um, so here we have something that's called also an asymmetric and horizontal add. Uh, so this is the first part, first step where we actually get to do um, something between uh, values within one register. So here's our um, asymmetric. So it's doing a minus on the high order words and a plus on the, sorry, plus on the high order words, minus on the low order words. It's called an add sub. How do they come up with these things? What do you think? Seemed kind of arbi arbitrary. You have some ECE dude, all right? Because they're the ones making this stuff. And they figure, ah, let me take these two and put them together. That can't be it. Right? They're, doing, they're doing something else. They, they're getting this from somewhere. Is it backwards compatibility? No, this is all forward. They're adding instructions. A lot of work for such an arbitrary thing. It's called profiling. Right? They're profiling their CPU. So you got these programs, you get a whole bunch of programs. And whatever is in PC magazine or something, right? They see, oh, this machine is faster than that machine, right? Or or I really care about this 3D rendering thing, or encryption, or looking at HTTP, yeah, decryption, I suppose. Um, or, or maybe it's uh, some RAID implementation if you're a server uh, kind of thing. OK, so, so what happens is they see, oh, there's this key algorithm that needs to go really fast, and it's always doing an add and a sub. Right? 
what can we do to help? So you have all these dependencies in the code, and, and right now they're pulling all this out into general purpose registers because they want to do different things to the different values, and they're wasting lots of cycles. If they just add this little thing, and this is super simple, right? This is an intern pro, uh, project at Intel. And so um, add this little thing, and now suddenly you're shaving off 10 cycles of the tight loop in this really important function. That's awesome. Right? Now you're suddenly twice as fast. That's essentially how it goes the whole time. Right? Uh, there's lots of, if you look at the uh, details of the instructions, there's lots of instructions that are there specifically for AES encryption. Uh, I think that's for like uh, en encrypting your disk contents. Um, or there's um, specifically for um, uh, uh, MPEG compression or decompression. Because that's things that you test and things that people care about. They want to watch Netflix. It should ru run quick and, and not use too much power. So, so great. Let's add a thing that does like that one operation that they keep doing all the time in, in MPEG. Let's add one instruction for it. OK, so here's, uh, yeah. Sorry. So every time they do this, every time they add more instructions, they're taking up more space on ship. Yep, yep. Are, they, are we giving anything up to have all of these new instructions? Or is there a, how long, could, is there a kind of Moore's law curve on how long we can be doing this? That's a very good question. I don't think that there is a fundamental limit because you could always make the chip larger. Uh, we've been lucky in the last 40, 50 years that things that are always getting smaller, like the transistors, uh, shrink by half every two years or something, or every 18 months. And, but it used to be like that. It kind of slowed down now. But, um, so then it doesn't matter. Like, oh, I got twice as many transistors as I did 18 months ago. Oh, what am I going to do with it? What are they doing? They're piling in lots of cash, because that's an easy way to use up transistors. And then they try to come up with some clever instructions here and there. But that's a, probably still a small part of the chip area. The cache is much bigger. What are we trading off? I think we're trading off cost. The main thing is chip, uh, chips cost by area. And so as they get bigger, they get more expensive. Why do they cost by area? Well, there's the resources to do it. But it's also more likely that you'll get some little defect. The bigger it is, the more likely that there's like the one, that one speck of dust or some imperfection in the silicon or whatever. And it's enough of one thing being wrong in this GPU is garbage. Uh, almost. What they do in, in the multi-core uh, chips is, so they spin out these new things with 28 cores. Right? That's what I saw recently. Um, and the 28 core one is really expensive. It's like six grand for one chip. Okay, I, I made that number up, but it's something like that. But then you get the 24 core one, and that's only 4,000. Right? And the 20 core one is like 1,000 maybe. So what's going on? Is it, you know, it's not like they made so many different chips usually. But they just make a lot of the 28 ones, and then a lot of them are broken, so they kind of just cancel it out. Like, and so then you get the kind of the broken ones, but everything works fine because you're only using 20, not all 28. Uh, I think that's why they're they're cheaper. It's much easier to do it that way than to make lots of different size chips. Yeah. Yeah, my cousin works at Intel, and basically he just said what he told me. Is, yeah, they just cool. some of them don't work as well, and they just sell them as this last core of chip. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Isn't that what Ryzen, Ryzen did with their architecture? Like if certain cores weren't performing well, they just shut it down altogether? Yeah, probably. I mean, it, it makes sense, right? Making one of these masks and setting up the machine to do this thing is really expensive. So let's just do the one big one and then see how it goes. Yeah. But, but we get more and more cores, right? So this is going to just get more and more common. I mean, you have a thousand cores. Who cares if like 200 are broken? It's OK. Uh, if you have a way to, to, to make them stop using power, of course. But I'm sure they have some clever way. OK. Um, so uh, SSE 3, yeah, they, they uh, had this uh, asymmetric thing and some shuffles. 
yeah, the shuffle is pretty cool. Let's see if I have a picture of that. Um, yeah, so it's a byte-wise shuffle. So all like now you have a 128 wide thing, right? And you can kind of select almost almost arbitrarily which order you want the bytes uh, to go in in the resulting register. Uh, let's add that byte-wise shuffle. And that's probably an expensive instruction. Um, okay, and and in SSC four there was just one that that was pretty pretty neat. Uh, it's called a horizontal search. Um, basically, it finds it's 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 got a pretty nice name. P H min pos U W. <laughs> I mean. Um, Writing this stuff doesn't come as natural as writing for general purpose registers, because there's so many different variations of everything. And, and we'll find, find out in a bit how we can get the compiler to do most of the work for us. But the compiler cannot, isn't actually able to do this well. Compilers do it OK. Um, good example uh, in, in my group, um, we were trying to do, and I think we'll probably do a homework on this. Uh, we're trying to find like, the, just the smallest value in an array of 256 values. Where is it? So you'd think, oh, it's, that's a heap. Right? It's a priority queue or whatever. Let's, let's just have a fine data structure with lots of pointers and just always have the smallest value at the top. And you add something, you update the data structure. But that's actually really slow. So for, for a small like list of 256 entries, it's faster to just do a for loop through the whole thing. So we did that, but it's not really fast. And then we try to vectorize it. So from the for loop, the simple one got like one million operations maybe. The vectorized version with the compiler with all the right settings. We tried all sorts of settings. I have a, I think I have a little table here from the guy who did, who did it, Sudipto. Um, so we tried with all sorts of different options and we got like from one we got up to kind of maybe like five which is nice but then he spent a good part of a semester and lots of meetings and we're doing some really clever little hackery and stuff and his implementation runs and that's hard coded well generated by a assembly generating program, but uh, that one gen does uh, 35 million operations per second. So if you write it right, you can go much faster than whatever the compiler can do. But it took you know, probably a couple months. So was it worth it? That all depends. I think it's worth it for our project. Um, was it worth it for him? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe we'll make a nice master's thesis. Um, and he got paid, so that's good. Okay, um, what was I doing? Yeah, okay. So this one here finds the smallest value in the array. Position uh, 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 unsigned word, but only for for sixteen byte values, right? Over uh, uh, two hundred. 128 bytes. So it's of these eight, find the smallest value. That was important for something. Um, it's kind of a slow instruction. Okay. Finally, there's uh, AVX, and and that adds. Now we have 16 256 byte values. And to make things a little more interesting, these are called YM, YMM. And they overlap. So, if you're familiar with x86, you know we have your EAX, which overlaps with your RAX, right? Which overlaps with your AX, which overlaps with your AL, right? Um, and so they f they follow that tradition. And so the Y registers look like this. 
the low order 128 bits are the XMM, and then the YMM is just above it. So you can um, you can directly access. Uh, you can mix and match instructions there. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, why, do you know if there's a reason why they didn't just continue overlapping with like, the original name for general purpose registers? I don't know. Um, I would think I. I would think that the general purpose ALU needs to go faster than the vector ones. There's like there's multiple paths and things. Um, oh, here's a good one. These probably don't use the register allocation buffer. I could be wrong. But there's a good chance that they are, are real registers. Um, they're not renamed and all this stuff that you get for the uh, speculative execution. Probably they don't do that for these. Yeah. Um, that's, that's speculation on my part. OK, so, um, so now we have quite a lot here. right? Now we can work with um, 32 bytes at a time if we want to do byte-wise operations. Really nice. Um, unfortunately. This is not, uh, do not support integer operations. Right. So we got, uh, we get our floats and doubles. And, and they all start with a V. Um, So the V indicates that, uh, actually, I'm not, aha. Oh, well, I think they work without the V. But if operations start with a V, are three operands. So you have your V, mul, let's see, P, D. So uh, this from the AVX. Instruction set, multiply, packed, doubles. And uh, so we can fit a double of 64 bytes. We can fit four 64, 64 bits. Four of these uh, in one uh, 256 byte register. So we might say x, y, mm, 0, y, mm, 1, and then 2, y, mm, 2. This is kind of unfamiliar. We don't usually have three operands. Um, so this is the, think of this order, uh, two sources and then the destination where we want it to go. All the previous generations overwrote one of the two uh, operands. Um, yeah, so I think it goes, if you use the V, you get three operand operations. If you don't use the V, uh, it's just a two operand operation. OK, so um, what's all this good for? It's basically when you have this massive data set that's kind of uniform, and you want to do lots of the same operations on it, which is very common for multimedia stuff and for science sort of things. So it makes sense. But as you can tell, using it seems like a real pain. Uh, there's, there's so many different instructions. There's lots of sort of arcane restrictions on which registers you can use to, to, together with which and what you can do with the values and the vectors. And so <coughs> to use them, there's a few ways that we can do it. Right. And um, I think the first step we need to do is Kind of uh, lay out your data, a program and data in a uniform way, right? because everything here needs to be. So a tree isn't going to do it for you. Right? If you have a, a fancy tree with lots of pointers and malloc things, none of this has to do with pointers. Right? It doesn't work at all. There's no dereferencing pointers in a big array. So have a big, flat array of things. That'll work fine. 
um, uh, use vectorization, auto vectorization in compiler, and verify that it it. it. And that's really important. Compilers have a hard time with this. It's, and we'll do uh, a whole bunch of examples, I think, next time. Uh, but it's really hard for the compiler to rewrite general purpose code into something that fits in these very rigid structures. So they have a bunch of special cases, basically. And, and that's what we saw for this loop that we had initially, uh, where they see, oh, fits this pattern. And then they try to figure out how much is it going to cost in terms of cycles. Right? So you have some sort of cost function um, to see if it's worth it. Because there's a setup, getting stuff into the register. There's the using the, these instructions, which may be a little slower than the general purpose instructions, and then get it, getting it out of the registers, uh, which oftentimes needs some memory moves. Um, and then they decide that it's, it's fine. And, and that point is probably pretty simple to do the auto vectorization, but to determine that it's correct and fit one of these patterns, um, it's kind of tricky. Um, so you need to be able to re read the code at least to understand if it did it right. And then when you see it did it wrong, maybe you can figure out why. We'll see uh, with LLVM, the sort of competition to GCC, um, you may have heard it as Clang. Um, there's uh, lots of good feedback. So it'll say, oh, I couldn't vectorize this loop because of this and that. We'll take a look at that um, on Thursday, I think. Uh, other good ways to do it is you use existing vectorized code uh, from libraries. I think that's probably um, good advice, like when we're doing a string search, let's say. Uh, should, we, should we vectorize it? Who knows? But it's really nice when libc comes with an awesome um, vectorized string search that is compiled for my machine. That's great. And then finally, uh, oh, actually, two steps, two more steps. Use compiler intrinsics. So this, an, an intrinsic, this is a function that comes, I think we should call it an intrinsic functions. I think that's what it expands to. Um, this is a function that is built into the compiler. Uh, it doesn't come with the language. C doesn't have anything that speaks about vectors. And there's no library. The, the, or maybe there's a library, but it kind of comes with the compiler. It's not like someone developed a library for it. Um, and it looks something like OM256 uh, mal SD. Right? And then you pass in a couple of values. And this translates directly then to uh, um, those vectorized instructions. These are vectorized pipes. Right, so now we're starting to get pretty close to the assembly, but we're not having to deal with register allocation and um, saving values away when you make a function call, that sort of thing. And then finally, to get to the, uh, unfortunately, even this isn't perfect because the compiler will make assumptions that aren't quite correct about how you want the program to run, like how, which registers you want to use for what, and so on, or just sort of a general purpose sort of thing. And so the last uh, resort is write small parts of inline assembly. Um, and that's not portable at all. Right. So there's plenty of job security in this line of work, because there's always new, new CPUs coming out, and uh, you'll want it to be uh, hard-coded for, for each CPU to, to go the fastest, but it only makes sense for really tight loops for specialized applications where uh, you can get a, a, you know, save lots and lots of money by doing it right. Okay, that's it for today. Next time we'll do a whole bunch of examples, see what the compiler can do and cannot, and uh, maybe have some nice pictures. Yeah, that's... I was a little hungry.